as I'm, pl as I'm playing the keyboard, even again this morning. I love seeing how you guys worship, and I can only imagine how you guys are doing it uh, at home, but it is so good to be in the presence of the Lord. If for 10 seconds you can stand up with me again, and let's take a moment to posture ourselves in prayer to receive what God has for us. If you want to open up your hearts and your hands, Lord, we open up our spirit to receive from you today. We want to receive the word from heaven. Lord, I thank you that you always have heavenly manna for us. There's always more than enough because you're a good God. And today you want to supply from heaven to us again. You want to minister to us. You want to move in our lives. And we want to receive that. Lord, go beyond your word. Go beyond me speaking. But go to our spirit and change our lives. Move in our lives. Like never before, let this be a season. We even talked about this last week of moving from a caterpillar into a butterfly. Transition to become that new creation. Lord, that is co-laboring with you and that is, that is just renewed because you are moving in our lives. Lord, we want to receive that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So today, and it's actually connected to even some of the messages that I've done in the last couple of weeks. We've talked about supreme coll collaboration. We've talked about the face behind the mask. Who are you really in a face-to-face -face relationship uh, with the Lord? And today I want to talk about the God factor. The God factor. And, and you can title this message uh, many ways, but, but actually I want to talk about God moving in your life. How God wants to move in your life and how God will move in your life, but also how you kind of can set your life up so that he will move more in your life. And, and here is a simple, simple truth. Uh, God is real. Amen? It, it, it is simple, but it's true. Like, like for me, I, I love, I think, I don't know if you watched it, but last Wednesday, uh, Elise and I had a conversation about evangelism. We were talking about even day-to-day -day, uh, life with God and the E for you. We had an interview. And, and, and one of the things uh, surrounding evangelism, if it's just us trying to convince others of our conviction or our theology or even our philosophy or even our, our paradigm on life, then it's just a mental action. But the thing about us, the thing about life is that we are representing a God that is real. One thing for my life, more than ever, more than ever especially in this time of, of COVID and, and of, of, of having time to do some introspection, looking at yourself, looking at the face behind the mask, I want to live my life. I've dedicated myself even stronger than ever before. That, and I'll describe it like this. If I can live my life for 80 or 90 years, and that life would be successful without the need of a real God, then I think I failed in life. Am I going too fast? If I would be able to live a successful life, to be rich or to be successful in, in all kinds of areas, and I'm 80 or 90 or 100 or 120, however old I'm going to get... <laughs> But if I look back and I never really had the need of a real God moving in my life, then I think I missed the mark. And missing the mark, another way for missing the mark, is sin. Then I've sinned. Then I've missed my purpose. Because my purpose in life is to connect with a real God. So I want to live a life where God moves for real in my life. More than just four years of Bible college and learning how it all works and theology and discussions with friends about end trip, post trip, pre trip, and, and whatever we can talk about. All, all good. If you were missing what I was talking about, <laughs> that's about end times theology when Jesus would return. Is it before the tri great, great tribulation or after? All that kind of stuff. But if that becomes all mental, if that all becomes you and it's not connected to a real God moving in your life, then we are just one of all the other religions. It's true. So what does God want? What do I want? I want to live a life that is a dance with God, with a God that moves in my life, with God that is a big factor of my life, so big that if God isn't there, my life is nothing. And yes, <laughs> and connected to that is that I know God is real, and he is, he, he is reality. He wants to move, and he is also reliable. God is reliable. These are my, my, my pre-points. 
So I, they're not the real point in the message yet, but to set it up, I've got just three R's to, to, to set you up for what God wants. God is real, and God is reliable. I can depend on Him. Like, I don't have all the answers. God doesn't always do exactly what I want. God doesn't always move the way I want. God doesn't always answer the way I want Him to answer. But I know one thing for sure. God is reliable. So if I live my life in surrender to a real God, then I want God to really move and I want to trust Him. That's where faith comes in because He is a reliable God. God knows what He's doing. That's where I also started my message last week. One of my first sentences was, God is not behind. In the midst of COVID, in the midst of end times, in the midst of financial crisis, but also even in the midst of financial prosperity, I want to live my life depending on a God who is reliable. And I know I have a God who's never behind the eight ball. He, he, he knows what he's doing. He's not caught off guard by COVID. He's not. Amen. I am. I'm, I'm honest. I never saw this coming. <laughs> but God does, and God did, and God is in control. God is reliable. So as I live my life in surrender to a real God, I walk with God who is reliable. And just to know that, as I set up my life, how do I live? How do I move? I say, okay, God, you are real, and you are reliable. And there's this third R that is so very simple, and this is still... Just a basic setup for how my life is set up and how your life is supposed to be set up, I think. If you want to miss the mark, don't do what I'm saying. If you want to hit the mark, listen to this. God is real, God is reliable, and God want re wants relationship. He wants relationship. He wants relationship with you. See, we had a beautiful time of worship this morning. And I believe in worship services like this morning. And in many ways, I think I made this comment to someone last week, that worship is sometimes overrated and worship is sometimes underrated. <laughs> we make this 30 minutes, 45 minutes, sometimes way bigger than it is, but also way smaller than it is. But here is the one thing that I want you to know. God is not waiting in heaven. Man, I can't wait until it's Sunday because then I can get my half an hour of attention from my church again. That's not how it works. When the body of Christ comes together, there's something beautiful and as we worship together, but walking in relationship with the real, reliable God who wants relationship, doing that and pouring out my life as I'm doing that is actually the biggest act of worship I can give God. It's 24-hour worship. And then when we get together, together we express like we did this morning, the goodness and the greatness of the Lord. And that's where I feel that sometimes it's also underrated, that as we sang, like we did this morning, God, you're so good. We as the church, as the body of Christ, are declaring the truth of a real, reliable God who wants relationship. And that's what God is inviting you to. That's what God wants. So now I'm going to dive into something more specific to talk to you today about the God factor. And I have three questions. I already asked them uh, if you're signed up to our newsletter. In the newsletter, you get that every Thursday at around 7 o'clock. It gets sent to you. And at the top, there's always a little write-up of the message from either myself, Pastor Doug, or if you have a guest speaker. But in there, I actually wrote three questions. And it was this. And don't answer me uh, with your outside voice, but with your inside voice. Maybe answer this question, because we're going to talk about this. If your life was a movie, would God play a part or would he write the play? If God was a, oh, sorry, if your life was a movie, would God play a part or would he write the play? Second question, and again, we'll look at all three. If your life was a business, would God call the shots or would he follow suit? And if your life was a trip, that's the third question. Would God steer the wheel or would he be enjoying the passenger seat? Would he be in the driver's seat or the passenger seat? And with these three questions, I've discovered this in my own life and also in the lives of many Christians that I've worked with. We all know the ideal answer. And you might be surprised by these three though because one of these I might answer differently than you might think. But 
in our ideological mind, we have answers to these questions. What I'm after for my life, and also for your life, is that we don't only have ideological answers, but real answers. Even if I connect this back to evangelism, because we as a church really feel that God wants us to move more in evangelism. But if what we believe in doesn't become reality, but only a mental conviction, there is no power connected to it. Nothing. And people will feel it. People will see it. People will know that you're just talking about your opinion, your theology. And then as soon as you don't have an answer, you're actually stuck. But when this becomes real, and when this becomes reality, and we, when then you're really representing a real God who is real and walking in relationship with you, and then you look at these three questions, even evangelism doesn't become a, a chore that you have to do that you actually feel condemnation about if you don't do it. It's an automatic result. It's true. God will open up doors all over the place. I see it in my life that people will jump sometimes, in, like especially non-Christians, they will just sniff, what's there about you? And then you pray for them and, and, and they're open. And I'm not saying that I'm there, I actually want to get better at this more and more and more. That's why I'm talking even what I'm talking about today. I want my life, when I'm 80, when I'm 90, I want to look back and I want to say my life is successful because God moved in it. Because I learned to walk with a real God, a reliable God, and a God that walks in relationship with me and I got strong in this. And I don't only want it for myself, I also want it for you. So if we look at that first question, if, if your life was a movie, would God be really writing the play or would he play a part? For many Christians, and sometimes also in my life, if I really am honest, I'm writing the script. In my mind, I'm telling myself, how I want it to go, where I want it to go, what I want it to look like. Let's get real. We're not talking like everybody theoretically will say, no, God is the, the one who writes, writes the, our lives. But in how we live our lives and how we're really acting, so often we're just, we're on, on, uh, on the driver's, no, not the driver's seat. We're not there yet. <laughs> but we're, we're writing it. We're writing the script. Whereas in reality, if life would be a movie, I wouldn't want to write the movie. I would want God to be the one who writes my life, and then I would play a part in that life. Like if you have a movie, it takes a lot of preparation. There's a lot of people involved. Uh, there's people who write, there's, there's, there's the person who writes the script, and then you've got stuntmen, and you've got people behind the cameras, and you've got the, the, the star players, and you have the supportive players, and we've got all these players. And it could be a good question. What role would you play in your movie? How do you see yourself? Sometimes even in church, we all tend to want to be the movie star, where maybe sometimes God is calling us to be a supportive star, to be a camera person, or to be this or that or the other. If God is right, because I'm, this question, I'm not only connecting to you as an individual, but also to us as a whole. See, if we tend to want to be the ones writing the script and actually also assigning the roles, we get into lots of fights even within the church. I feel I'm called to this, and I feel I'm called to this. I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel. And we get in trouble because the body of Christ is not functioning, here's the word again, in alignment with how God has designed it. God has a part for every, each and every one of, one of you. And in God's mind, the person who's the main player is not the, the best player. All of us are important. But God is the one who writes the script. My first point, that I want you to catch is God is the author. He's the author. That's my, my answer, not only theoret theoretically, but also for real. There's one scripture that I want you to look at with me. Um, and, and you can look it up already. It's in Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to start in verse 2. I'm going to read it in a second. But I love, like, like, I love messages that encourage us to have faith, right? We all should have faith. Uh, for me, faith, like the Bible talks about, faith can move mountains. Jesus says, if you've got faith of a mustard seed, you can tell this mountain to go and a mountain should go. If we're not careful, if we just combine that faith to an activity that you do, then you're losing what it's all about. 
if you catch this one, what's, what's in this verse, you actually understand, and it's so connected to the message of last week and two weeks ago about uh, supreme collaboration, the face behind the mask. All I'm constantly saying is God wants to live his life in connection with you. In a way, this, this is almost a spontaneous summer series that I'm talking about in every message that I'm doing in the last couple of weeks. It's constantly, constantly that God and you are working together. Remember that we looked at the Great Commission in Matthew 28, where we saw that it is sandwiched with Jesus says, I have all power, now go and evangelize, and I am with you. It is sandwiched with faith, with your life, with your walk. It's the same thing. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author, and that word author is archegos. And arche, ar arche is, is such a famous word that we know, but it is the chief. It means the leader. It means the prince. It means the, the one that takes the lead in anything and thus affords an example. I'll say that again. This is the definition of that word, archegos. One that takes the lead, the initiative, in anything, and through that gives an example shows how it's done. Follow me, do as I do. That's what Jesus does. That's who he is. It is a predecessor in a matter. He's the pioneer, the author, the one who takes the first initiative. That's who Jesus is. For your life, he took the first initiative. For me, that is so important. If I look at my life, I want God to be the author he, I want God to be the archegos. I want God to be the one that sets the precedent. Precedent. <laughs> I want God to be the one that shows me how it's done. When we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, when we said about that he is the supreme one and he wants to collaborate with us, but he is the one that writes the script. He is the one that says, this is how it's done, now follow after me. That's why, again, even in a worship moment like we had this morning to talk about Jesus, Holy and anointed one. Jesus at the center of it all. That's, that's where the key to success in life, if you want the success that I just talked about, that when you're 80, 90, or 100, and you look back, I hit the mark because I lived a life in relationship with a reliable and a real God. If you want that life, then you have to embrace the fact that Jesus, not you, is the author. He is the one who sets the president, precedent, not the president of the United States, but the one who was first, the one who says this is the example. Let's keep reading. He is the author and finisher. And the finisher is tele teleotes, which means the perfecter. It's again that sandwich thing. So he starts it. But he's also the perfecter, or some other definitions, I'll give them to you, the completer, the finisher. One who has in his own person raised faith to its perfection and set before us the highest example of faith. So he started it and he finished it on the cross. That's where he showed total faith, total surrender. I think I've said that in the last couple of weeks again too, and I'll, I'll repeat it. For both faith and grace, you need humility. You need surrender. And Jesus started it, and he finished it. He completed it. So the author of your life is Jesus Christ, the finisher of your life. In that way, for me to be successful in life in accordance to how God intended my life, there's only one option. And this is not an opinion, this is not a conviction that I want to convince others of in a sense, like if you disagree with me, we can't be in the same church, whatever. This is essential for me for life. There's only one option for my life. That is that Jesus writes it. That he writes the script. If I write my script when I'm 80, 90, or 100, there's a big chance that I might have missed the, missed the mark. Sin. And again, when I say the word sin, I'm not saying this as condemnation. I'm saying this as a challenge. I don't want to miss the mark. I want to live a life as a pastor, as a person, as a parent, 
as whatever I am, as a person who can say, Lord, you are the writer. You're the one who shows me the example, and when I'm weak, you're the one who actually helps me to finish it. Because that's basically author and finisher. He's the one who writes it, and he's the one who perfects it. So when you're weak in Christ, you're strong. It's again that beautiful sandwich for any task that the Lord has for, for us, whether it's evangelism or just simply living day-to-day life. I almost want to shake you awake, <laughs> wake you up, realize Jesus goes before you, goes behind you. He is available for you, and He wants to lead your life. So if life was a movie, would he be the author? If in your case, the real answer, not the ideal answer, but the real answer. If in your life it is, oh yeah, I know God plays a role. And he plays a pretty big role, actually. I, I made him the movie star. God is the movie star in my, in my movie. And, and, and like, like, he, like everybody sees him, he's at the... And at the same time, you're writing the script. And how, what does that look like practically? You're making Jesus do what you want him to do. Right? If it rains, you need the sun to shine. If it snows, you need it to go. (laughs) And if he doesn't, you're upset. Like in relationship with God, of course, we can ask for the sun to shine and for the snow to go. All that stuff is okay. But I'm talking about the essence of, of how you position yourself when you pray that way. Because the reality for many of us, and so often I have to... That's why I set this before myself. This is a principle of life. This is what I want for life. And I pray, Lord, never let me get derailed from this. I can make Jesus the superstar of the movie, but if I still am writing the script, I am missing the mark. Because the reality is, if you want to hit the mark, surrender to Jesus. Not only that one time in your life saying, I give my life to you and I... I repent and I get born again. That's so crucial, but that's not the end of it. That's the start of it. That's the start of a life in surrender to God. And Jesus promises that if you're willing to lose your life, if you're willing to surrender this way, He promises you that you will actually find it. So you will have a better life by doing this surrendering to Him than when you write it yourself. How good of a writer you might be, God is always a better writer. He is. He knows better how to write the script of your life than you do yourself. He does. So surrender to him and let him be the author. So if life was a business, would he call the shots? And for me again, I'm going to now state the truth, which I believe is the truth for a life in surrendering to a real, reliable, relational God. So my second point very simply is, the answer is yes. God calls the shots. God calls the shots. And a very simple example of this one is what I really like uh, with the story of David. When David became king of Israel um, and and all of Judah, the whole, like he became king of the whole kingdom, um, right away there was warfare. We would call it spiritual warfare, but for him it was a real warfare. It was a matter of life and death. And I love how David, who was the king, he was now in charge. Actually, like even some other kings had, had sent him material for him to get a, get a castle, and everything was like he was in charge. He was in control. He was the leader. And at the same time, he knew, David knew, who really called the shots. Let's read the example, or let's read the story. Second Samuel chapter 5. And we're going to start in verse 17. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king of Israel, they mobilized all forces to capture him. He is at the center of the will of the Lord. He is doing what God called him to do. And right away they tried to kill him. Isn't that so beautiful with life sometimes? I love that actually, if you read about Lazarus, and and I think it's John chapter 10 and 11, Jesus raises him from the dead, and as soon as he was raised from the dead, the Pharisees tried to kill him. (laughs) So you're raised from the dead, you're alive in Christ, and right away there's warfare. That's the truth even here for, for David. He was king, he was finally reaching his destination, and then 
they tried to capture him. When the Philist Philistines heard that David had been anointed king of Israel, they mobilized all their forces to capture him. But David was told they were coming. So he went into the stronghold. The Philistines arrived and spread across the valley of Rephaim. So David asked the Lord, here's the key to your life. He writes the scripts. So for key decisions, this is what you need to do. David asked the Lord. David didn't tell the Lord. He asked the Lord. Because he knew God calls the shots. So he asked the question, should I go out and fight the Philistines? And will you hand them over to me? What should I do? What's going on? Give me revelation. David knew he had a real God. David knew he served a God who was reality and reliable and walked in relationship with God. That's what David is doing. Beautiful. So the Lord replied to David, yes, go ahead and I will certainly hand them over to you. So David went from Baal Perizim and defeated the Philistines there. And I love it because he did the fight. He held the sword. He did the thing that he had to face them face to face, and they were literally trying to kill his body. But David's answer was, the Lord did it. He knew who was really calling the shots. Not I did it, even though I worked hard and I almost got killed, but I did my best. But the Lord did it through me, and he gave glory to God for it. The Lord did it, David exclaimed. He burst through my enemies like a raging flood. So he named that place Baal Perizim, which means the Lord who bursts through. The Philistines had abandoned their idols there, so David and his men confiscated them. So this was basically, let's say, the first Monday of him being the king of kings of, that, uh, of, 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 of the, uh, the, the nation. Monday. Then Tuesday happened. But after a while, verse 22, the Philistines returned again, spread out across the valley of Rephaim. And again, David asked the Lord what to do. So, so fundamental. David asked the Lord what to do because he knew that God was calling the shots. And then the Lord says this, do not attack them straight on. And basically what God was saying, what worked yesterday won't work today. And that's what we so often do. Because if we have one victory of the Lord on Monday, we kind of expect that on Tuesday he will give that same victory again. And you know the very reason why God doesn't do it? Because if he would live that way, then we wouldn't need relationship anymore. Because then we found the method, and we'll keep replicating the method. And if we replicate the method, then we, could, we think we replicate the same result. But then again, you could live a successful life out of your own strength. If you want to have that life in dependence on God, then what worked on Monday, on Tuesday, you say, Lord, what do I need to do today? What worked yesterday doesn't work today. So the Lord said, let's keep reading. Instead, instead, circle around behind and attack them near the poplar trees. When you hear a sound like marching feet in the tops of poplar trees, trees be on alert. That will be the signal that the Lord is moving ahead of you to strike down the Philistine army. That will be the signal that I am with you because we are co-laboring and I am writing the scripts and I am calling the shots. So when you're asking me what to do, I will be with you because you're surrendering to me and you're actually listening to me. That's what this story is basically saying. Verse 25 so David did what the Lord commanded, and he struck down the Philistines all the way from Gibeon to Gezer. It is so important to know that in your life, he doesn't only write the script, but he should also call the shots. And so often, again, also for many of us, we say this in theory, but the tendency is so often that what worked yesterday should work today, and then when it doesn't work today, we actually get disappointed. We think, God, well, you did it yesterday. Why aren't you doing it today? Yesterday the snow went, and today the snow returned. <laughs> Why? Elijah did the same thing. We all have that tendency. Because the Lord is not a machine. The Lord is not a robot. 
The Lord is not something you put money in and then you get the result. The Lord that we live with is real. Wants relationship, is reliable. Jesus never did the miracle the same way twice. Why? Because he wanted to show it's a dance. It's a relationship. It's not just something that you gotta have in your life so that you can get successful and get everything you want. This is total surrender. This is totally saying, Lord, here am I. You call the shots. So what the Lord told you yesterday, one of the things for me to realize this truth is that I say to myself, Lord, instead of investing my time and energy on knowing the right things, I need to invest time and energy in knowing your voice, in knowing what you have to say. Because if I spend time and energy in knowing the right things, then again, I'm setting myself up for, I'm writing a script and I want my successful life. If I'm, setting, if, if I'm setting my life up and I'm investing my life in wanting to hear the voice of the Lord, then I know that what God says on Monday might be different on Tuesday, but He will hear me. And maybe on Wednesday He will say, oh no, this time, leave these Philistines alone. Don't do anything. And that's what the Lord will show you if you live in that surrender. So we go to the third question. And the third question is, if life was a trip, would he be in the passenger seat or would he be in the driver's seat? And here is the part that I'm, I think I might trick you. Because if you go to the first two questions, the tendency so often to say, yeah, this is it. God is the author. God is uh, calling the shots. And we've actually established that that's also the truth. And on this one, we often say, no, God sh it should be in the driver's seat. But actually on this one, my third point is this. For your life, you're the driver. You're the driver. He is the author, so he says you need to drive to Rome or whatever. He sets the direction. He actually gives the instructions. But you're the one having to drive the car. That's where you get to make your own decisions. David, when he heard from the Lord, he could have said, okay, Lord, what you said yesterday, uh, I'll do the same thing again. And he could have decided to go left or right. Life isn't that way fun. And actually, that's the art of relationship that God wants. He's not, he's not a robot, and he's not turning you into robots either. As he calls the shot, as he writes life, he's not controlling you with buttons, and then you automatically do all the moves, and you do exactly what he wants. He's actually saying, I've provided life, a car, and you can sit and enjoy, and I'm sitting with you. I'm cheering you on. I'm helping you, and I'm, I'm like a driver's instructor. We're saying, oh, oh, be careful. And actually, like, I don't know if, yeah, I think you have that here in Canada too. When I had my driver lessons over in the Netherlands, my driver's instructor also had a gas pedal and a brake pedal. And even though I was steering, and then if something went wrong, suddenly the car stopped. And I thought, how, how did that happen? The guy in the driver's seat was able to stop me from doing something stupid. That's what God can do if you're living in surrender, if he's the author and all of those things. But in life, he is saying, I want you to drive the car. I want you to go. Two scriptures that I want to lead, uh, read to, to wrap this up. This scripture has so been speaking to me, I actually referenced it also last week. It's Numbers 624. It's the famous priestly blessing, and it shows to me again what God wants. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. If you want to know more about even what all these words mean, Listen to last week's message. I actually explained these words. I'm not going to do that again. And be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So the Lord is actually shining his face upon you, but he wants you to radiate his face. He starts with the blessing, but then he says, you need to drive the car. And, and uh, how you might be asking, how do you see that in here? Well, I'm not totally seeing it in here but I'm going to connect it to Genesis. Let's read it together again. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. When Adam and Eve were released in the garden, see this. Then the Lord blessed them. So the blessing of His face on you, so that there is light, and then your, His face radiating off you. God wants to radiate His face on you so that we radiate His face around us. He blesses us. But this is basically what God did when He put you in that car. Back to Genesis 1:28. Then the Lord blessed them 
and if you have a Bible that you can write in, I would underline or circle or whatever you do, that word and. He didn't just bless them, but and said, now be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, govern it, take care of it, influence it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry around the ground. So God is the author. He calls the shots. But then he says, now get in the car. Let me sit beside you. Let me bless you. But then from that, be a blessing. Be released. Go into all the world. I am with you. Now do it. Enjoy life and let me cheer you on. Are you with me? Yes, let's give the Lord a hand for that one. Because he is the author, he calls the shots, but he's letting you drive the car. And the question is now, if you drive the car of your life, when you drive the car of your life, are you inviting the author and the one who really calls the shots in order for you to be successful to sit next to you? Or are you ignoring him? These three points, in my mind, are so highly connected. Because the Lord has given us a free, free will, we get to do so many things, and we get to, if we want to, we could ignore Him. In the Bible, we see many examples. David, in the story that we read, was listening to the Lord. There's also a time that David didn't listen, and it got him in big trouble. There's other times in the Bible that they stepped away. Biggest example is probably Adam and Eve themselves. This is what they were charged to do. He blessed them. He laid hands on them. And then he said, go. And then they said, we can do it on our own. And they got kicked out and all of that, all the stuff that happened took place. So you have that choice. You can actually respond to the Lord and say, you know what? Just, and this is an area of what I feel that God is inviting you and me and all of us to repent. And what do I mean with repentance? It is changing your thinking. Because repentance is, I used to think this way, but now I'm going to think a new way. Caterpillar, butterfly, new thinking. And the repentance is this. When I am going to be 80, 90, 100, or however I'm going to be, I want to live my life in such a way that God is the author. He calls the shots. And I had an amazing ride driving because he was with me. And I'm not, I'm repenting of. And all of these things are not bad things what I'm saying right now, but they shouldn't be primary things. They should be secondary things. And what do I mean? Pension, success, big house, even health, and all of these things that we need, they should be secondary. And if you are planning your life to make those secondary things primary, you're missing the mark. And God is saying, I want you to hit the mark by making me the author, making me the finisher. Let me call the shots, and then let's enjoy the ride together. Why don't we stand together? Lord, I thank you for your presence. You're here. We've acknowledged your presence all through this morning. And even right now, if people are here in the building, and this is, doesn't have to take long, but if you're here or if you're watching a live stream and you don't know Jesus Christ and you want him to call the shots, you want him to write your life, and then you want to enjoy the ride with him as your passenger together with you, and you want to say yes to Jesus, why don't you acknowledge it on the live stream right now in the chat room or however you can do it, or here in the room, if you want to say yes to Jesus, why don't you raise your hand right now so we can pray together and you can go together to Jesus right now and say, Lord, I want you to be the Lord and Savior of my life. If this is you, just raise your hand and then we're going to pray together. And if people are watching my live stream, just say the sentence, I want to give my life to Jesus and our moderators can help you. If this is you or if you're watching later, just pray this right after me. Lord Jesus, I surrender to you. I give you the control of my life. Lord, without you, I've missed the mark. I have sinned. And I ask you to forgive me of all my sins, of all my mistakes. Cleanse me and make me a new creation because I surrender to you. Fill me with your spirit. 
and let me live this new God life with you as my author, with you calling the shots, and then me driving together with you and enjoying the ride in Jesus' name. Now for the whole church, if you just want to open up your hearts and your hands, Lord, we'll come together into the presence of the Lord and just take 10, 15, 30 seconds to, if you need to, repent before the Lord. Change your thinking. But part of changing your thinking and part of that repentance moment is saying, Lord, I'm sorry. I want to change. I want to say yes to you being the author. I'm sorry that I made you maybe the star player or maybe even a small player. I want you to be the author. Just do it right now. I'll give you just a few seconds to do so. And Lord, as we've done this, I pray in Jesus' name especially that the ears of everybody here and the eyes of everybody here, spiritual eyes, spiritual ears, will be opened to hear the voice of the Lord like never before, to know what you're saying on Monday and what you're saying on Tuesday, to know how you're calling the shots. Lord, I release an increase on that in Jesus' name. Sensitivity to hearing you in Jesus' name. Do it right now. Do it right now. Release that right now in Jesus' name. Let us be sensitive to heaven. Let us be sensitive to your voice like David was. Yes, there it is. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Not in a religious way. Not in a manipulative way. But in a real way. In a real way. Show yourself as the real God, reliable God and relationship. Lord, I pray that the Lord will bless you, will keep you, that he will make his face shine upon you, that he will in that way throw his face on you and that you will radiate his face and that his favor will be with you and that you will have the peace of the Lord in everything you do. In Jesus' name, amen. The church here.